Welcome to another Now Playing vlog where I talk about the games that I've been playing lately. This video wouldn't exist without the support of my Patreon backers. If you'd like to help Actual LOL grow bigger and better, head over to patreon.com forward slash actual LOL to pledge. Let's get on with the video. Catch the Moon is a dexterity game that I've played a whole bunch of times. And in this game you have these wooden ladders and you start with two ladders attached to this cloud and then you're trying to build up by putting ladders and create this crazy structure and catch the moon. On your turn you roll a dice and you're told by the game you pick out a ladder whether that ladder has to touch one other ladder in the existing structure, two and only two, or you have to catch the moon. Now attaching to one ladder is tough because you're having to balance it or hang it off an existing ladder and if there's 20 ladders on the structure, how can you do that by only touching one? Touching two can be tricky as well, but is often a little bit easier and allows you to have a bit more balance. And then catching the moon is really hard where you have to put your ladder on and it has to end the turn being the highest point on the entire structure. So generally it requires you to be really daring with where you place it. If you don't meet those criteria, if you touch too many ladders or if you don't catch the moon, you take a teardrop. The moon has cried and uh, that's effectively a penalty point. The person with the least penalty points at the end of the game wins the game. And I really like this game because it's a really simple dexterity game, but yet it has enough rules to make it competitive. Most dexterity games, imagine Rhino Hero. This is a game that I really enjoy, but the rules to the game are slightly aside from the game. You're really just building card towers and enjoying it. There isn't much that I, I, I kind of almost forget about the rules on the cards and the winner is kind of by the by. In Catch the Moon, it actually feels like the person who won deserved to win. They were the person who made the least mistakes and people are gonna be making mistakes all over. I really like it because it's a fairly small box. I like it because it creates these wonderful structures. I like it because when you place a ladder, they're so light, they're made from this lovely light wood, that the structures can swing. They're, they're really balanced on nothing. They can swing but still stay upright. And that creates this, these heart racing moments. And I, I really enjoy that as well. But yeah, crucially, it's about having a dexterity game that's simple, plays really quickly, that has all the tension and fun of Jenga or Rhino Hero or all of those stacking games, but with just a few very simple rules. It doesn't, it doesn't weigh down the game at all, but it makes it a game. I actual love Catch the Moon. It's attractive on the table. I like that when you put a ladder down, and you fail, it doesn't ruin the whole game. You don't have to then set it all up again. You, you get your punishment, but the structure lives and continues. I like that it's got simple rules that work and it's fun and it's not easy. It's got some real challenge. So I actual love Catch the Moon. Memoir is a memory game. In fact, for Little Britain fans, it's a pirate memory game. And in this game, there's a grid of cards all face down in the center. Cards can be one of five animals, such as penguin and walrus and crab. And they can also be in five different settings, such as the jungle and the desert and the sea. And so you know three cards at the start of the game, and so do the other players. One person will flip over a card, and then you take it in turns to connect to the card that's been flipped. So if a penguin in the jungle has been flipped, the next person has to flip over a penguin or a jungle card. And then if they flip over a jungle card, let's say with a walrus on it, the next person has to flip a walrus or a jungle card. And so you keep going around trying to find a connection. If you fail and you flip over a wrong card, then you're out of that round and the other players keep playing until one person is left that person gets some treasure. They've won that round, they get rewarded for it. You play a number of rounds and then the person with the most treasure at the end wins the game. And it's really simple, but it works. I don't think I've got any memory games in my collection. I'm kind of put off by them. It tends to be more of a kid's game. And yet memoir, it gives you a reason to want to remember the stuff. You want to get that chain. 
and you start to see patterns, you start to remember the, the more rounds, you, you might play the first round and not that many people know that many cards. And so you only flip over sort of five cards, but as the rounds go on, you see more and more of the board. Now, knowing three secret cards yourself is also interesting because you know them very well, you know exactly where they are. But if you reveal them, you're giving away information to the rest of the game, to the other players, that you know, and that's your information. So you would rather unveil one of their cards or the communal card. And I've found that whilst a lot of people complain about memory games and being a nightmare to play, everyone that I've played it with has enjoyed it, but also had a similar skill level. There wasn't anyone that sort of totally smashed everyone else. And there's also an advanced variant where you have powers for each of the animal, and that makes the game even more interesting. The penguin allows you to secretly look at another card and put it back down so you have a bit more information. So it makes the penguins really valuable, and people want to always jump to the penguins that they know about to get those free uses, because once the penguins have been revealed, then nobody can use them anymore. The octopus has to be exchanged with a card adjacent to it, which makes it really hard. It messes with your head because you thought a card was in one place and it's not anymore. That's really hard to keep track of. I was pleasantly surprised by this game. You feel real pressure on every single turn as you think your mind's playing tricks on you and you have to go with your instincts about where you think certain cards are because you certainly can't remember where what all the 20 cards are. And then there's such elation every time that you reveal one that you really weren't sure about. It's a small box, it's quick to learn, it's quick to play, and yet there's real challenge and I've just had a lot of fun with it. So I'm definitely keeping memoir. Russian Bash is kind of like Mario Kart the board game. It's a racing game, you each control a car and you've got to get round that lap the fastest, the person who gets their first wins. And you're doing that by playing cards. So you have movement cards that will move you one to six spaces and you just play a card per turn, but each card also has a special power. So you can fire missiles at people, you can drop bombs which explode and throw people off, you can uh, switch lanes, you have to play a special card to switch lanes, so that's it makes it tricky to be able to move around those bombs or there's boulders in the road, and you have some health so you're not immediately killed when you first get hit, but if you get th hit three times and you don't heal yourself, then you spin round and you get put back to the last uh, checkpoint. So it's just like Mario Kart, where you are massively put behind, but you're not out of the race. You still get, have, have an opportunity to win, especially if other people get hurt as well. And of course, then you're behind and you can start throwing missiles. And just like in Mario Kart, they also give better special abilities and faster cards to the players behind. So that's a really nice balance to the game. If you're in first place, you only get to draw from the, the card deck for people near the front of the race. So you're never gonna be going very fast. If you're in last place, you're gonna be drawing these pink cards that always are sort of fours, fives, and sixes. And so for as long as you're in the back, you're gonna be going a lot faster. So th there is a tactic to staying behind, just behind the pack, always getting those good cards and then saving them and using them later on in the game to really accelerate past everyone. And I love the obstacles in the game, the volcano, where if you end your turn on certain spaces, you might get hit by the volcano. That's nice because it requires you to make a decision about where you're gonna drive. Do you go that bit faster, a bit further, or do you play a, a smaller card knowing that you won't go as far, but it's safe. It's out of the spot of the volcano. There's a rickety bridge that if there are too many cars on, you roll a dice and you might all fall into the lake below. People that like really heavy strategy games aren't gonna love this game because there's a lot of back and forth and a certain amount of take that, but it does feel balanced in a sense because because of those cards that help people behind, um, because being in front is sort of punished in that way, the, you tend not to have people going way out in front like you do in some racing games. And so I like that. And it, and it means there's a climactic finish to it. You don't know who's gonna win. It works better with more players because then there's more interaction, there's more chaos, there's more fun, there's more excitement. But it does mean that the game takes a bit longer because you've got to wait for sick people to play their cards. And there's an expansion available called Winter Is Now where you can play with eight players and it brings in a whole bunch of new special abilities and new track obstacles and stuff. So I'm looking forward to trying that one as well. But 
I've not had a brilliant time with a lot of racing games. I didn't especially like Formula D or Snow Tails or Ave Caesar. What I like about Russian Bash is that it isn't just racing. There isn't one person that gets way ahead and then you just wait for them to win. It has that interaction. It has fun and like silly moments. So it's not going to be for everyone. It doesn't have loads of strategy, but I think it's a fun family game with excitement and that's what I think a race should be and so I don't play Mario Kart anymore but I like that now I have a board game version of it for a similar feel. Russian Bash. Flatline is a real-time cooperative game from Renegade Games that is a sequel to Fuse and both of these are frantic games that involve rolling dice and deciding where to put them. Flatline has a medical theme-ish where you're supposedly trying to save lives that's my first issue with the game is that the theme just doesn't come through at all. You don't even see any people. It's really just these bits of card with some dice symbols on them. But that's the idea that you're racing against the clock and the game works where you have one minute real time rounds. So there's other admin to be done and then you all roll your dice at the start of the one minute round and you have to decide where to place them. And that's where the discussion and the shouting comes in because you're racing to try and put them down most efficiently. You can't re-roll your dice in this game unless you spend one dice to allow other, uh, one other player to re-roll, but that's of course very wasteful. The more you do that, the more you're not gonna have enough dice to treat the patients. And that one minute is really intense, but I would prefer a game real-time co-op games that have a longer period of that stress because in Flatline they've added extra elements to, to keep up the pressure. They have these cards that come out each turn that are going to make things harder and if you don't deal with them then it's going to mean you're more likely to lose and it makes it more thinky but it makes that thinkiness <laughs> during the admin phase. It, it's not during the real time. I like a real-time game to put you under pressure, to have it to think on the spot. But in Flatline, you effectively do all your planning and all your thought about what you should best tackle before the one minute, and then the one minute starts and you desperately hope that the dice come up. And that's where there's a fair amount of luck in this game, because if they don't, then you're gonna be using dice for re-rolls. You maybe have to try and rethink your strategy on the spot. That, I mean, that's kind of nice aspect of the game, but you spend more time dealing with the cards, um, talking about what you're gonna do, and less time actually enjoying the frantic nature of the game. The mounting tension of the cards that come out and you have to deal with them, it, it's, it's nice, but I feel like it overcomplicates the sort of game that doesn't really lend itself to being that complicated. So Flatline is sold as a more involved version of Fuse, and I actually, uh, passed on Fuse um, ultimately as well. I I prefer a real-time co-op game that has a bit more of a journey to it. Escape Curse from the Temple is, is my ideal replacement where you have those 10 minutes and there's an arc to it and you desperately have this final finish and there's also fun elements that are added to the game such as curses that mean you have to only use one hand or not talk to your fellow players, things like that. Sometimes there isn't a great climax to flatline because you can get into the final round knowing that you can't win, that you haven't treated enough patients and th that's a bit disappointing as well. So flatline is more for somebody that wants to plan to beat a game and I feel like the real time part is a little bit secondary and that's fine, I, I, I don't think it's a bad game. I've certainly enjoyed it, but I just don't wanna keep playing it. I don't think it has a future in my collection. It works well in what it's trying to do. I just think what it's trying to do isn't the optimum level of what I want from a real-time cooperative game. I prefer to play Magic Maze, Escape Curse from the Temple, things like that. So I didn't keep Flatline. Secrets is a game that I picked up at UK Games Expo. This is from Bruno Faiduti and Eric Lang who made HMS Dolores, which I liked last year. And this is trying to do something vaguely similar in the sense of a small box and it's a social interaction game. This is a hidden team game. It's got a Cold War spy vibe, so 
one team is American, one team is Russian, and then you've also got hippies that are trying to win on their own. So the way the game works is that on your turn, you draw two cards. They're different characters in the game. They will do different things. They're all worth differing amount of points. And generally you want to collect points for yourself, but also for people on your team. And then most of them have an ability, maybe to look at someone else's faction, swap around cards, attack them, things like that. But the aim of the game is to get them the most points for your team. So as long as you and the other people on your team have the most points, you're gonna win. Unless the hippie has the least amount of points. If the hippie has no points or less than everyone else, then they win and none of the teams win. But you start the game knowing who you are and who the person to your right is. So it's nice that you've got that bit of extra info. But that can change. There are cards that allow for movement, secret movement of the tokens that determine who you are. And then you can't then look at your new one necessarily. So you might be something that you, you don't know who you are. And that in itself can be quite a frustrating part of the game. Some people like that. I don't think it's terrible, but I think if you've got no information, then this game is a bit weak. And I think there are times where you can have no information. Like you don't necessarily need to know who you are to be able to help the game, but you need to know who other people are. And you might get to a point where you don't really know that. Playing, the way the cards work is that you'll take two on a turn and then you'll, you'll tell everyone what they are and then you'll offer one of them to another player, but they don't know which one it is. You can tell them what it is, but you could be lying. And then they choose to take it or reject it. If they take it, it goes face up in front of them. If they reject it, it goes face up in front of you. So you could give them a bad card um, and hope that they take it, but they might reject it and it ends up with you and it might lose you points. And there are things like the assassin allows you to put bullet cards in front of other people, which will be negative points for them. So you're trying to balance it, you're trying to work out who's on your team and that's really hard. So it really just comes down to talking it out. And so I like that there's a lot of discussion in the game, but it feels like sort of blind discussion. You don't really know what you should be saying because if you just out yourself as one thing or another, then that isn't very use useful to you, but it's very useful to everyone else. But again, you can't really talk to anyone else. There's no code you can use. You're having to talk out in the open. So you just all kind of tiptoeing around, not wanting to give anything away and learning nothing. And I think it doesn't have that kind of deductive element that you might get with watching the way people vote in the resistance or certainly with Avalon. And there's just too much chaos with those allegiances moving around that you can't track anything. You don't ever feel clever and so it feels quite a thin game and I, I can definitely see getting caught up in that chaos, getting caught up in the discussion. I can imagine having fun with it and I have had fun at times, but I've also had it feel full completely flat where everyone's just like, well, that felt pointless. I didn't know anything and we just did stuff and then it ended and yeah, so the secrets has not worked for me and not for most of the people that I played it with. I just feel like I'm missing something. And it's a real shame because it comes with these wonderful Baker-like pieces that um, show you who your role are and they look like they wouldn't like get damaged at all. So they'd be great for lots and lots of plays. But there's just too many games of this type out there and so many games that I would prefer to play over it. So it's a, a strong pass for me on secrets. Those are some of the games I've been playing lately. I've put links to all of them in the description of this video. If you'd like to support Actual LOL grow bigger and better, please go to patreon.com forward slash actual LOL and pledge. I'm John Perkis, thanks for watching.